last time when I was asking you about the uh, 0.4 question, everybody, anybody remember that? And nobody answered? Uh, now I understand why. The Xerox that you had that you were all supposed to be looking at, the, um, the light part of that uh, histogram, so there's a dark part and a light part, the light part comes out looking like a grease smudge at best. That's if you squint really hard, you can see that maybe somebody had a you know ate pizza and and left a little mark there. So anyway, I've re I've re uh, xeroxed that page with the uh, the light portion on it as well. I don't know why it didn't xerox the first time, but uh, now with that, reinterpret my 0 0.4 question. Uh, and see if that makes more sense. So pass these around. Okay. And anybody who didn't get the, uh, the basic handout from last time, I do have a few more. Um, one here. Or you can come up afterwards. Um, all right. So we're talking about hidden Markov models. And remember that the key distinction between a Markov model and a hidden Markov model is, anybody? What's, what's the crucial distinction between a Markov model and a hidden Markov model? Yeah, I think in a Markov model, we assume that the Markov chain, there is only one model. But in the hidden one, we assume that there is not only one model, maybe more models. Yeah. That's true in the example that we showed, but and, and it's almost the general statement, but not quite the general statement. Um, so for those of you who didn't hear it, it's okay too. Uh, anybody else want to suggest a, a distinction? Okay, the critical distinction is this. In a Markov model, in both models you have states. And when you... Uh, I like to think of this as executing the model or, or using the model to generate a sequence or ge generating a sequence of, of outputs or emissions. Um, so both the hidden Markov model and a Markov model do that. They, they move from one state to another and generate emissions that you get to see. But in a Markov model, just by examining the emissions, examining what was produced, you know what the sequence of states was that were traversed. In a hidden Markov model, you can have more than one state that produces the same output. And because of that, you don't know, just by looking at the output, what the actual state transitions were. And the key thing you try to do in a hidden Markov model is by looking at the output, try to deduce what the actual chain was that generated that output or at least find the chain that's the most, uh, this, with the highest probability of being the one that produced that output. And so it's, it's that kind of inverse problem. If you drop in on 90% of the people who use hidden Markov chains or hidden Markov models and you ask them what is the key ingredient or why, why are these called hidden Markov models, they won't know or they'll say it's because we don't know what the transition probabilities are. That's what's hidden to us. Well, that's almost always true, even with a Markov chain, Markov model, you don't always know what the right parameters are. But that's not the aspect that makes it a, uh, a hidden Markov model. Okay, so we were talking in particular last time about uh, CPG islands. And a hidden Markov model for that, we had one... Uh, Markov model for the plus, that is sequences that were actually um, generated from, uh, be, from being in a region, a CPG-rich region. And then we had a Markov model for the minus model, that is for sequences that were outside, and we had transitions. Uh, remember, we have A plus state, T plus, C plus, and G plus, and then we had the A minus, and so on. And then we had the transitions between these. So 
So this whole thing is a big, horrible mess, which I can't replicate. But there's a Markov model inside here with all kinds of edges and probabilities. The Markov model in here with edges and probabilities and, trend, and uh, edges that go between these two models, which are transitions. And there are probabilities on those as well. Okay, And you can imagine there's a begin state, which takes you somewhere with some probability. And then there's an end state where things end from each of these in here. So I'm being very um, abstract here because we've, this is now the third lecture on this, and we've seen some of the details, uh, some of the pieces of this in, in greater detail, and I don't have the time to recreate all the details here. But I hope everybody remembers what this looked like, what this looked like, and uh, you have the notes in front of you if not. All right. So now the issue is, uh, well, imagine we, do, we have these uh, appropriate probabilities. And I told you last time at least one way in which those probabilities are obtained from uh, actual training data, data that, where we know what portions of the DNA are in CPG islands and which portions are not. And from that training data, you can uh, get probabilities here. And uh, our problem now, uh, several different versions of it, is that we're given a new sequence. So you're now given a new sequence. Here it is. And you believe that some portion of that is a CPG island. And the other portions, or maybe there's several of them. But the point is you don't know where the island is or even if there is uh, an island in there, a CPG island in there at all. And what we want to do is to use our existing uh, hidden Markov model to try to figure out, try to deduce which portions of the sequence are in the CPG island. Okay? So... Um, if this is an appropriate generator of real sequence, sequence that has some portions that are from CPG islands and some that are not, then uh, any particular sequence, let's say um, CCAGGAT, I'm just making this up. Um, if it's a CPG, I guess you'd expect some Cs and Gs near each other. Um, but this sequence could have been generated by coming down into the minus portion, generating a C and another C and another A, and then maybe coming up here and generating a C and a G and another G, and then maybe coming down here. But there are many other ways to do it. And this is, this is a hidden Markov model because uh, there's more than one state that, that can produce an A, and similarly for the T and C and G. So if I just tell you this is the output of this model, you don't know what the Markov chain was that produced this. However, if this is a probabilistic generator, a true probabilistic generator, then um, this, and, and how are we generating sequences? We're, we're, from the begin state, we're following a single arrow depending on some probabilities, either this arrow or you know, all the other arrows that I haven't shown or down here, and then from there we're, we're flipping a coin again. Always the next uh, move, the next transition is based on the probabilities of the edges that are out of that particular state. So we flip this, uh, we're here and we flip the coin based on these probabilities and decide where to go next and what to output. And my point is that if we run that movie over and over again, Maybe a movie is not a good term for it because it, if it's a movie, it should do the same thing each time. If we run that experiment over and over again a zillion billion times, this sequence will be generated with some probability. Okay? And moreover, the, um, the particular Markov chain or the different Markov chains that could generate this will, be, uh, will occur with certain probability distribution as well. So for this particular sequence, if you specify a particular Markov chain that would generate it, like this C 
followed by this C again, followed by this A, followed now by this C, and so on, and all the way to the end. That particular Markov chain has some probability of happening, some frequency of happening when we rerun this thing uh, a zillion billion times. Okay, so. Um, and for a particular execution, a particular Markov chain, you know which of those, um, if you're looking at the Markov chain, you're looking at the series of states, not just the output. You know which of those states are in the plus model and which are in the minus model. So uh, if you're told that this section was generated by the plus model and this section was generated by the minus model, then you'd say, well, this is the sequence that's in the CPG island. Okay. All right. So after all that uh, verbiage, if you're now given a new sequence and you want to try to deduce which sections are CPG island and which are not, how do you use this? Is it, is it clear now how you should use this? Or at least what you want from this thing conceptually. Okay, I'll step it through a little bit more. Given a new sequence, okay, there are many, or there may be many, but in general there are many. Markov chains that would generate that sequence. Okay? Here's an exam question. Is this true of Markov models? No. In a Markov model, there's only one Markov chain that generates a particular sequence. But in a hidden Markov model, it depends on the sequence, but in general, there's more than one Markov chain that generates that sequence. Okay? So there are many Markov chains that would generate that sequence. Each has, each chain, each such chain, has some computable, it's knowable, probability of being the chain that generated the sequence. Okay. So remember, a chain, a Markov chain, is a series of states that actually uh, are used to generate that sequence or generate a sequence. Okay. So if you tell me again, here's a, here's a sequence, but you now tell me what the actual states were, or a series of states that generate that sequence. That series of states is a particular Markov chain, and because there are probabilities written on these. Uh, on these edges, uh, you know what the probability is that a particular chain, that is, you can compute. It's, it's conceptually computable. It may not be easy, but it is computable to figure out what the probability is that, that a particular chain generated that sequence. Okay? You would need to know uh, all the other chains that could generate that sequence as well. But all the information is there. Okay, and in each such chain, because it's a chain, you know which of these states are part of the plus model and which are part of the minus model. And so from a particular chain, you can say, I think this is the CPG island because these were generated by states that were in the plus model and, the, and these were in the minus model. Okay? So many chains that can generate a, a given sequence, 
each chain has some computable probability of being the one that actually did generate that sequence. So what do you want to do? You've got the model. You've got the sequence. You've got this formalism about probabilities. You're trying to figure out what really might have generated that sequence. What should you do? You want to know the probability of this chain is generated from the, the CP island. It's higher than random. Sorry, say that again? <laughs> uh, you want to know the probability of this particular sequence yeah. is generated from the CP island, CPG island. Right. It's higher than it just randomly generated. Uh, uh, okay, that's using a, this as a discriminator. Well, what was what was suggested here is that you want to um, compute the probability that this was generated by this model as opposed to this model. And that would be true if we, if we were just looking at a single sequence and saying we think this is inside of a CPG island or, or we want to know if it's inside or, or not inside. But our problem now is a little bit more general. We're given a long sequence. Some is inside and some is not inside. And that's the reason we combined the plus model and minus model into a single model where you can move from one to the other. Okay? So we want to parse this whole sequence into those sections we think are from the plus model and those we think are the minus model. So my question again is, given that's what we want to do, given that we think that sequences are generated by this model, and we have a specific sequence in mind. What is it we want to do? We can find the part of. Uh, you want what? We can find the location of the CPG island in a given sequence, so we can determine. I mean, according to the probabilities, when the probability is high, there's a high possibility that we have a CPG island in that sequence over there, and when the probabilities are low, there is less probability that it will be the one possible to generate that sequence. Okay, that's taking half the step there. Uh, anybody else have another suggestion? Yeah. Right. That's exactly what I do. And, and it's very similar to if in, in, in philosophy to things, other things we've done. We want to find... Uh, the Markov chain, let's give this sequence a name. Let's call it S. The Markov chain, which generates <coughs> S, so it's, it's got to be one that actually generates S, um, <coughs> with the highest probability. Um, it is every chain that generates S has some probability of being the chain that generated S. And we want to find that Markov chain whose probability is largest that it generated S. The probability that it generates S is larger. Um, actually, no. <coughs> We want to find the Markov chain, which generates X, S, with the highest probability over all Markov chains that generate S. So let me, again, try to motivate this by going back to here. This is... Imagine this is, our, our, this is how sequences get generated, okay? There's a little place in space which, you know, generates these uh, molecules that then float around and uh, become part of life. And it generates molecules by running this thing. And when, when a Markov chain is being run, each transition is decided upon based on the probabilities uh, at the state that, that the chain is in at that moment. 
And so some sequence gets generated, and we do that a zillion billion times or more. And some of those chains generated this sequence. And so we have a probability distribution uh, on how frequently the different chains that generate this sequence come up. Sometimes, uh, let's just say there, you know, there are 10 different possible chains through here that generate this sequence. So of course, it's actually more. We, we actually know how many there are. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 positions, and each one of these could be generated either by the plus state or minus state. So we have two to the 11th Markov chains that can generate this sequence. Each one of those particular Markov chains, two to the 11th, comes up with some frequency when you run this thing an infinite number of times, or infinity minus one times. Okay? So um, there is a, a, dis a frequency distribution on the Markov chains that generate this sequence. And now if we have the inverse problem that we're given this sequence and we want to know what might have generated it, what Markov chain might have generated it, we want to find the Markov chain, which among all the 2 to the 11th Markov chains that generate this one, is the one with the highest probability. There's the one that, <coughs> whose frequency in these generations uh, is the largest one, is the largest, okay? Does that make sense to people? A lot of words. So I want to tell you how you do this, but it's, very, it's even more important to, to have some appreciation for why you want to do this. Okay. When you found that particular Markov chain, and I say the here, although if there are ties for probability, then you probably want to know all of them. But once you have, let's say, a clear winner, you have one Markov chain out of the 2 to the 11th, one Markov chain that whose probability, whose frequency out of these zillion billions is much higher than any of the other Markov chains that generate S, then you, you say, OK, I think you know, that's, that's the most probable explanation for how S came about. That's the most probable Markov chain that generated S. And then because that's an actual Markov chain, you have states in it, actual states, you can just look at that and, and see which states are plus states, which are minus states. And that tells you which, sec which sections of S for you to guess, you know, uh, to gamble, if you will, are from a CPG island and which ones are not. Okay, And that's the whole philosophy of this kind of backward inference. And if, you're, um, if you've taken statistics courses, you should be able to relate this approach to all kinds of other things you've seen. Okay, I'll give you fancy words for this, but I, I won't. Okay? So this is what we want to do. Right? And again, I, I really want you to understand why, why we want to do this. Um, there is one other way that people try to approach this inverse question. Well, I shouldn't say just one. There are other ways. But this is the dominant, philosophically dominant way that people approach this. Okay, so this is the what question. Now we want to solve the how question. How do we find the Markov chain that uh, has the highest probability of being the one that generated S? Okay. Anybody have any ideas? Brute force would work. I mean, we could generate all the 2 to the 11th Markov chains that generate that sequence. And we can certainly calculate by using the probabilities on the edges what the probability of each one is. And then we just look over the 2 to the 11th. And that's actually not so bad, because 2 to the 11th, what is that, uh, 2,000? Something like that. that. That wouldn't work. That's not so bad in small cases. Okay, But in uh, richer Markov chains, which had more states that might generate a particular character or longer sequences, you'd be out of luck. So in this class, when brute force fails, what do we try? DP, right. 
Okay, dynamic programming. Now, uh, dynamic programming is a general technique. It's more than just for sequence alignment. You've only seen it for sequence alignment, so uh, you haven't seen a nice example of, of where it uh, comes up in other kinds of um, applications or even what makes a particular approach a dynamic programming approach. And uh, it's, it's actually hard to give a general definition of dynamic programming. You just know it when you see it. But uh, in the community of, Mar of um, hidden Markov models, uh, they didn't see it, apparently, when the algorithm was first invented. So it's called the Viterbi algorithm. And again, this is one of those things that maybe not today, but at least five years ago, if you talk to people who were users of hidden Markov models and you'd ask them, how do you compute the Markov chain with the highest uh, probability, they would say Viterbi algorithm, but they wouldn't have any idea that it had a relationship to dynamic programming. So Viterbi is actually a, an engineer who is, uh, uh, lives a few blocks away from my parents. <laughs> Other than that, I don't know much about him. Um, anyway, uh, so Viterbi in this, in this world is a very famous name. But it's really just uh, dynamic programming. And so I'm going to give you the dynamic programming. We need the base cases. We need the um, recursion. And then we need to, to know how to do the traceback. And usually the hardest thing in any dynamic programming is just getting your notation right, getting the terminology right that's going to, uh, going to be used. Okay, so um, let me make sure that I'm in concert with what the notes are calling things. Uh, all right, so let me make some definitions here so that I can be a little bit more formal. So AKL, that's the probability of transition from state K to state uh, L. So you imagine you have the states in your, mark in your hidden Markov model are labeled somehow by, well, I mean, we have them labeled over there. They're just they were A plus, A minus, and so on. But here we're just being a little more abstract. And the transition probability of going from this state to that state in a single step is now being written as AKL. Okay? And then you have uh, another definition. Let me write it over here. Um, E L X I. Um, all right. So this is the this is the probability. that in state L, the uh, symbol or character XI is emitted. And XI is the ith symbol uh, in the output. Okay. Now, in the Markov models, that, the hidden Markov models that we're looking at so far, the one that's over there, what is, uh, what are these emission probabilities? Anybody tell me what, what numbers show up? Yeah. This is just a. Uh, hmm? 
No, no, that's too fancy. <laughs> You've seen too much of this already. Uh, now, just, this is just a question of, of who's understanding the notation. Okay, in the Markov hidden Markov model that we we have here, well, I should be over here. When you're in this state, you generate a G, you emit a G with probability one, and you emit any other symbol with probability zero. Okay. But the notation is more general than that. The notation would allow some probability distribution in this state. So ATCG. So in general, in a, mark, in a hidden Markov model, a particular state is not associated with just one uh, given output. And certainly the opposite is not true. Each output is not just associated with a single state because that would just be a Markov chain. But even a single state is not necessarily associated with just one output symbol. It's associated with a distribution, a probability distribution. Okay? So the meaning of, of this ELXI is, well, XI is the ith symbol that's output. So we know what that is whenever we're interested in knowing this probability. And this is state L. And so this is just, what is the probability that in state L you output this symbol XI? And the point is that for that hidden Markov model, this will always be either 0 or 1. But I'm just saying that to um, you know, make these definitions concrete. In general, this could be any probability, okay? and often is, in, in different kinds of um, hidden Markov models. OK, with that, what is it we want to compute? Um, so here's another definition. V L I geez, is the probability that a sequence X one up through xi, there's the first i symbols of the sequence. Are generated by a Markov chain that ends in state. L. Okay. So V, there are two parameters here. One is I, and that's saying we're interested in the first I characters of the sequence um, of interest. So S, this is this is from S, from the sequence of interest. So what is the probability that the first i characters are generated by some Markov chain that ends up in state L? Okay. And with that notation, okay, um, What is it we're ultimately interested in? Hmm? Well, let's see. Oh, hold on a second. Now, the probability of VK is the most probable path ending in state K with observation I. Yeah. 
Um, well, if we have an end state here, okay, then if I finally compute V E, and let's say the sequence of, is of length N. So this is the probability um, Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 no. I know what my problem is. Hold on. The probability of the... We actually will compute what I just wrote down later, but that's a different philosophy. The probability of the most probable... Markov chain... that generates x1 through xi and ends in state L. Okay, so what I had down before is a different, something else will compute, but that's a different philosophy. So. VLI is the probability of the most probable. What's the most probable Markov chain that generates the first I characters and is in state L? Yeah, now you got a question? So in this XI is in state L, this XI is the last one. You only need the first I. I is not necessarily the last the last one. <coughs> You say that n is state L. Yeah. So I wonder if, if, if the whole, you know, the sequence is from x to xi, so x and i must be state L. xi is going to be generated in state L, yeah. Oh. So xi must belong to state L. Yeah, it's, it's just a, that's a, a matter of definition, whether you want to say this was generated before the transition to L or it was generated while you're in the transition L. And when we look at the recurrences, while it's in state L, when we look at the recurrences, we'll, we'll be able to do, uh, distinguish that, which interpretation is the right one. Either way would work, just, but you do have to be consistent, like writing a program. Uh, knowing. So what I mean here, this is a little ambiguous, but this is saying, um, what's, the, what's the probability of the most probable Markov chain that would generate all of the N characters, that is the entire sequence, and end up in state E. It would be finished. And X okay. belongs to station state Well, that's the same question. Yeah. yeah, and we'll see it from, we'll see the answer from the recurrences in a minute, okay? Um, yeah, that's, that's a phasing question. All right. Now, but before I go and show you the recurrences, what does this remind you of? It should remind you of something. Well, the dynamic programming that we used for alignment it had two sequences, but we were always discussing the prefix of one sequence and the prefix of another sequence, and we were asking for what was the best alignment value of those two prefixes, okay? Um, now we're not talking about an alignment value, we're talking about a probability, but, we still are take, and, but we're taking a prefix of the sequence that we believe was generated, the sequence of interest, S, and now we have this notion of states, but uh, you'll see how states come up in alignment as well. You can think of, you can think of putting the alignment issue uh, in this framework as well. And it shouldn't be a great surprise because this is dynamic programming and we computed alignment by dynamic programming. And dynamic programming uh, solves larger problems by relating its solution to the solution to smaller problems. So the larger problem is align two sequences in their entirety or compute the probability of something related to a long sequence. And you relate that recursively to the solutions for smaller instances, in this case, prefixes. All right, so we don't, we've seen several examples of dynamic programming. Let's try to invent the recurrences. Of course, the recurrences, you start out with the base case, all right? 
So what is V0 of 0? Or I guess this is um, V, let's call it the, ba the begin state. Okay. What's the probability uh, of the most probable Markov chain that generates nothing yet and is in the begin state? That's one. Okay. And then VK for K not equal to the begin state of um, zero. What's that? So it, just interpret it. What's the probability of the most probable Markov chain in this, in this model that generates nothing? Nothing is emitted, but it's in some state K other than the begin state. What's the probability of that one? At zero. So there are our, our most fundamental base cases. Okay. Then the the recursion or the recurrence relations. So we're interested in V L I. There it is the definition. Okay. Um, well, let me just write it down. E L X I times the max over all possible K of V K I minus one A K L. Okay, so let's try to parse this. It says, well, um, in state, so, so now we know what, well, the interpretation is, in state L, you generate the ith symbol of that sequence, or the xi output. Okay, and that happens with some probability. Remember, this is general. In, in this particular model, it's either one or zero. Okay, but in the elf state, you're going to generate, you're going to emit this particular symbol, and this is the probability that you do it. And now the question is, here you are in state L. Where did you come from just before that? This is a Markov chain which ends in that, which is in that state when it's emitting the ith character of the sequence. Where was it before that? It might have been in that one, or that one, or that one. OK? If those are the immediate predecessors, then they go from uh, that state, which is k, but k here we're taking over all possible k all possible k. It goes from state, the, the Markov chain goes from state k to state l with this probability, akl. Well, that's what's akl. And if that was the preceding state, just before you came to here, and when you're here, you're emitting the ith symbol, then when you were in there, you have generated the symbols. The Markov chain has generated the symbols from 1 to i minus 1. And this is the probability that that happened. This is the probability of the best, the highest probability Markov chain that generates the first i minus 1 symbols and ends in state k. And then this is the, the next probability transition. And when you're in state L, this is the probability that you emit 
symbol Xi. Okay? And so this is the best, this is the probability of the highest probability Markov chain, the most probable Markov chain that ends in state L having produced all of the symbols 1 through I of the sequence of interest. All right? And mechanistically, you can write a little program that, that does this for I equals 1 uh, up to, to N. You just keep running around this thing, a little teeny program. You could write it in Perl in five minutes if you had this, these uh, probability values available to you. You need to know the E values. You need to know the AKL values. Those are taken from some table. And um, and that's basically it. All you need to know what the termination state is. When do you stop this thing? Okay. Uh, you, you have to have, you want a special symbol for the termination, and when you get to the termination, then you are not going to produce another character here. All right? So in, mar in dynamic programming, what's the other thing you need to do? If I wrote a little program that does this calculation, I would end up with the value, with the probability of the most probable Markov chain that generates x1 through xn, and ends up in state E, the end state. But that's not just, I don't just want that number. I want to know what the Markov chain is. I want to know the actual parse because the Markov chain tells me uh, which states were in the plus model, which ones are in the minus model, and that tells me where to place my bet. And all this is just gambling where to place your bet that uh, uh, which, uh, which portion of the sequence is in the CPG island and which one is not, okay? So what do you do in general in dynamic programming when you want to compute the actual uh, solution and not just the value of the solution? You need a trace back, just like in alignment, okay? And so you need to remember as you're going forward in each state, where you got your best value from previously. And so in this notation of the, uh, of the notes here, what they do is this. PTR, which stands for pointer, I, L, okay? Why they now put this one as a subscript and this one and not, well, who knows? But at any rate, the pointer that you want to leave, the breadcrumb you want to leave from state L and uh, character, the ith character of the sequence is the argmax of k vk i minus 1 akl. Has anybody ever seen argmax before? Well, it was all out of time, time, but anyway, that's not something we normally, I mean, even typical mathematicians don't know what that is. That means uh, the value of K, argmax is the value of K that maximizes this expression. So all it's saying is you're going to leave a pointer from state L in uh, character position I you're going to leave a pointer back to that state k that gave you this highest value. It's identical to this except for the ELXI because this is the same for all k. I could have put that in there as well, but they, they were saving themselves in the notes keystrokes. Okay, so this is the Viterbi algorithm for the CPG, but it's pretty close to general. And if you understand this and see how it's related to dynamic programming, you're way ahead of the crowd. <laughs>